So I will start. I, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, many people who are interested in energy in general. My talk is going to be quite different. It's going to be very much computing oriented in terms of especially how we design modern computing systems. As everybody knows, uh, we want to design computing systems that are much more intelligent uh, going into the future uh, that can do everything for us, let's say, uh, more or less, uh, and also improve our lifestyle, etc. cetera. Uh, and I will uh, question how we are designing the computing systems of today uh, in this talk. That's why it's titled Intelligent Architectures for Intelligent Machines. Oh, sorry. That's the last slide, so <laughs> we can go backwards on the slides, but that's probably not a good idea. Okay, uh, so uh, I think it's clear today to everyone that uh, computing is bottlenecked by data. We have a huge data deluge in computing, and we're trying to deal with it. We're trying to make sense of data in all aspects of life, in all aspects of science, in many different scientific fields, and we're trying to make use of data, but we're bottlenecked by it also at the same time. Many applications, AI, machine learning, genomics, many other important applications going into the future are all data intensive. They require rapid and efficient processing of large amounts of data to make very quick decisions in terms of, for example, life critical decisions about a patient's life or uh, safety critical decisions when you're driving a car or a plane. And data is increasing, for example, we can generate much more data than we can process. And just to give you some examples of workloads that we're dealing with, uh, these are some traditional, more or less traditional workloads that we've been used to databases, graph analytics engines, data analytics engines, data center workloads. And all of these workloads are bottlenecked by data. Data becomes a huge performance and energy issue in them. I'm going to give you some results later on. And if you look at the mobile end, which is going to be even more important to the future, the workloads that we're relying on, machine learning frameworks, video, encoding, decoding, which we're using right now, browsing, and many, many more workloads are also uh, bottlenecking our performance energy because they're very data intensive. And increasingly more important workloads into the future like bioinformatics genome analysis is even more data intensive because the cost of uh, sequencing uh, genomes is reducing significantly. You can see that compared to Moore's law, the cost of sequencing a genome is reducing much faster than the cost of a transistor has been reducing for decades, as you can see. As a result, today we're able to sequence many, many genomes and we can revolutionize many areas in health, science, medicine, and biology going into the future. The problem is, even though we can sequence things very, very fast, we cannot analyze the data fast enough. As a result, we have a huge data analysis bottleneck that is preventing scientific discoveries and that's preventing medical advancements in the field. And I'm very interested in this topic. I'm not gonna talk about bioinformatics work that we're doing in this area, but you can see that now you can have genome sequencing machines that you can fit in your uh, hand like this. And it's going to be much, much more interesting going into the future. These devices are very, very powerful. Unfortunately, they're powerful at sequencing, but they're not powerful at analysis of data, which is what we really need. We want sequencing and analysis at the same time. And to be able to do that, we need to change the computing paradigm so that we can actually analyze the data where it's produced and uh, minimize the energy consumption, minimize the performance overheads as we will discuss. Okay, if you're interested in this topic, we have recently written uh, an overview article that's relatively accessible to many people in the world, hopefully, uh, that talks about accelerating genome analysis and what we can do in the future with it. And we have also a very technical articles that try to accelerate approximate string matching, which is at the core of genome analysis, for example. And I'm happy to talk about it separately, but I'm not going to talk about this in detail in this talk. But this is one of the examples of the approaches that we need to take going forward to make data processing much more energy efficient and high performance. And you can see this is and a device that exists today, you can plug it into your phone and you can sequence your genome. But again, the device is not powerful enough to do really interesting processing of data. Uh, because when you do really interesting processing of data, you want to get this device into the hands of a doctor, for example. And the doctor, uh, by, uh, by comparing this to uh, many, many genomes, for example, your genome, uh, they basically give you a personalized decision in terms of what kind of uh, treatment or what kind of drug is much more suitable for you. Uh, in a very life critical, time critical manner. And today that analysis can take in the order of weeks and sometimes months, depending on the analysis that you want to do. We would like to reduce that analysis time to seconds, if not minutes, so that we can actually make these decisions very, very quickly. And this is just one example. You can give similar examples, of course, in COVID-19 uh, processing today, for example, understanding COVID-19, understanding new types of 
uh, bio viruses, for example, is going to be very important going into the future as well. If you're interested in this, we have other talks on this topic. You can take a look at these talks on our YouTube channel. And we also deliver talk lectures in our uh, lectures. OK, this is just one example application that is very hungry of data. And it's going to be more important. But many applications are like this. And as a result, data today overwhelms modern machine storage capability, communication capability, and computation capability. It greatly impacts robustness, energy, performance, and cost. This conference is very much about energy. But energy is related to robustness, performance, and cost, and scalability as well. So we're going to talk about a lot of these things in this talk. If you look at the fundamentals of a computing system, it consists of three key components, computation, communication, and storage and memory. And we have heavily optimized the computing units for decades and decades, and more or less ignored the communication and memory storage units. As a result, a computing system more or less looks like this today. You basically have computing uh, parts that do computation, processing elements that are cores, and everything else is dedicated to moving and storing data, caches, interconnects, other caches, other interconnects, memory controllers, memory interconnects, storage devices. So if you do the math, more than 90, 95% of a single node is dedicated to data storage and movement, not computation. Even though this is called a computing system, most of the real estate is not dedicated to computing, it's dedicated to data storage and movement. And this is because we have a processor-centric design paradigm. Everything has to go to the processor to be processed. As a result, we're building our systems, in my opinion, completely wrong. As a result, data is overwhelming modern machines. I'm gonna give you more examples of this. Uh, and this is one example. This is a study that we did with Google over the course of one and a half years. We published it three years ago. And we basically wanted to understand the data, uh, energy consumption and uh, performance uh, in these workloads that are really important that many, many people use. And we found out that more than 60% of the total system energy in these workloads is spent on just moving the data around not doing computation, not even storage, just moving the data around so that you can operate on it. And we would like to eliminate this data moment. So my axiom for the rest of this talk is we want to build intelligent architectures for good reasons. Those intelligent architectures have to handle data well if they need to be intelligent. Of course, the question becomes now, how do you handle data well? And I think there are three major directions. I'm gonna focus on only one direction in this talk given the time constraint. And that's going to be the first direction, which is ensuring that the data does not overwhelm the components that we built via intelligent algorithms, via intelligent architectures, and via whole system designs, all the way from algorithms, architectures, to devices, whole stack. Second, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but we want to design intelligent machines that can take advantage of vast amounts of data and metadata that can improve architectural and system level decisions. For example, today's humans are very good at learning over time. And if they're not good at learning, then they have a problem, of course. But uh, machines are not very good at learning over time. And we want to actually have every single component in the machine to learn as opposed to be driven by human designs. They need to be designing themselves over time. Third, we want to understand and exploit different properties of different data such that we can improve algorithms and architectures and various metrics so that the architecture, underlying architecture can distinguish between different types of data and different properties because different data have different properties. The different data have different security properties, privacy properties, safety properties, energy properties, approximability properties, compressibility properties, locality properties, and so on. Today, we're not distinguishing them in our system designs. As a result, we're wasting a lot of energy and performance. Okay, so corollary is based on these three directions as today's architectures are not good at dealing with data. As I said, they're designed mainly to store and move data as opposed to compute because they're processor centric as opposed to data centric. We want to move to a more data centric paradigm and process the data everywhere as possible, wherever the data resides, as opposed to just in the processor. I'm going to give you more examples of this in this talk and focus especially on this one. I'm not going to talk about these two in much detail, but I think holistically, these are extremely important also. Today's architectures are not taking advantage of the data. They're not learning from the data that's flowing through the systems. They're not learning from the decisions they make in the past. Because they make human-driven decisions, the human designer dictates the decisions, the data is not really changing the decisions uh, the machines make. So I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to refer you to some uh, lectures. And third, architectures are not able to know and exploit different properties, different semantic properties of application data. As a result, they're designed to treat all data the same. As a result, they make component-aware decisions as opposed to data characteristic-aware decisions. And we need to change that. Basically, we want to design architectures that are data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware going into the future. And today we're not doing well in any of these, in my opinion. But to be able to do that, we really need to revisit the entire computing stack that we have relied on. The computing stack translates algorithms to devices and electrons in the end. Algorithms eventually orchestrate electrons. 
And the computing stack needs to be designed completely differently so that we can make it data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware. But I believe we can get there step-by-step step, evolutionarily as opposed to completely changing the world in one day, potentially in some domains that could also happen. But we will discuss how to get there also briefly in this talk. So let me focus on only one aspect of this, which is a data-centric or memory-centric architectures. Even this aspect is actually very interesting, in my opinion, because a data-centric architecture has multiple properties, not just one property. And these are four different properties that I listed over here. We want to process data where it's produced, where it resides, without moving the data around. This is called processing in and near memory structures. I'm going to focus more on this. But we also want low latency access, very quick access, very low energy access to data. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. This is very important. This requires a design mindset change. We want low cost data storage and processing, high capacities, because data is very large today. And we want intelligent data management as well. We want intelligent controls handling robustness, security, cost. I'm going to talk about this to motivate processing data where it resides, because if you want intelligent controllers that can intelligently manage data, you really want some intelligence inside the memory structures or the sensor structures or the camera structures, for example, wherever you're producing and capturing the data. So this is going to be a motivating factor for the first part. But let me jump into the first part a little bit. I call this processing data where it makes sense, as opposed to today what we're doing is wherever data is produced, it doesn't get processed there. It gets moved to at least a processor. And that processor may be close, but still you move the data over the interconnects that are energy hungry. That processor may be far in a faraway data center. Then you move the data across even more energy hungry interconnect to somewhere that's really far. And I think this doesn't make sense basically. What it makes sense is we want to actually combine the processing and the generation of the data at the same place so that we minimize the data movement as much as possible while making good decisions at the same time. That's what this, make, this says basically. And this is not a new idea. This is an old idea. Basically, uh, processing in or near memory was proposed in the 1960s when the processing paradigms are being explored. And this is a paper that was written by Harold Stone Logic in Memory computer that says, we want logic and memory together. Now, it didn't work out well for various reasons. Uh, I'm not going to go into the historical aspects of it in this particular talk, but you can listen to our lectures related to this. But today, we're in a special position. That special position dictates us to do something completely different in terms of how we deal with data. And this special position actually is pushing us from the technology. Technology is pushing us to do something intelligent with the data, with our system designs. And the applications and systems, I, uh, like I talked about earlier, is pushing us to do something different. So we're kind of stuck in the middle. We have to do something really different with our systems to change the paradigm. So let me talk about the push from technology because a lot of people ignore this push from technology, but it's extremely important because it's, uh, it, that's why we're dealing, we're, we're having a lot of trouble today with data storage and movement. So what is this push from technology? Basically, we have some storage technologies for memory. It's called DRAM, dynamic random access memory. And it has been scaling well so far, but today it's in a very difficult position. As a result, industry is putting controllers close to DRAM and industry is very much open to new memory architectures as they should be. So let's talk about this. So this is one example. You have 3D stacking technologies where you have memory layers and logic layers and computing can be very close to logic. And there are also another example, other examples of this. I'm going to talk about more examples that we're working on, for example. You can do some simple non-deterministic finite automata processing inside the micron chips, for example. So, sorry, it should be deterministic finite automaton processing. And this is really uh, motivated by memory scaling. Technology scaling is not going well. And we have been talking about this for a long time. This is one paper that I would recommend to people. And we have been doing studies also. This is a study that we did with Facebook in 2015. We studied all of the memory errors that they have in their data centers. And they have many, many data centers, a lot of memory in their large scale production data centers. And we did a study that examines the failure rate of the servers and correlates that with the memory chips. So you can see that the, as the density of the memory chip increases, the failure rate of the server increases. Why? Denser, newer memory chips are much less reliable. Why? Because they're more vulnerable to noise. Their storage cells are smaller. As a result, they're more vulnerable to noise and their storage cells are closer to each other. So we're packing a lot of storage into the same memory chip and that makes the memory chip less reliable and more vulnerable to errors. And we need to handle these errors somehow. Those error handling mechanisms are causing us performance as well as energy overall. And that is a problem, of course. Now, if you're interested, you can read more about this. It's fascinating, I think. But we also designed infrastructures that are more small scale, FPGA based, reconfigurable architecture based infrastructures to understand these memory errors in much more detail much more sophisticated detail. I'm gonna give you a story of one of the issues that we have been investigating. You can see some of our infrastructures that we have been building at Carnegie Mellon and ETH Zurich. 
We also open source these infrastructures. It's called SoftMC, for example. You can more easily program this and understand the memory errors in your system. And industry and academia have been using these infrastructures to do very, very interesting studies beyond what I'm going to describe to you. So while we were doing a lot of these studies with our infrastructures, we discovered something very interesting together with Intel. And we found out that you can predictably induce errors in most memory chips that you have in your computers today. Now, this should not happen. No one should be able to induce memory errors in your memory chips in a predictable manner. And this is known as the Rohammer problem. Uh, and we showed that more than 80% of the tested DRAM chips are vulnerable. And this is really the first example of how a simple hardware circuit device failure mechanism can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And people are writing articles that sound like this. This says, forget software. Now hackers are exploiting physics. And I like this because this is really getting to the core of the problem with Rohammer at a high level. So let me talk about the problem. So a problem is actually very fundamental. In memory, in DRAM, you have rows of cells. In, ro in these rows of cells, you store data. This could be very important data. It could be security critical, privacy critical data. Now, if you want to access the data, you need to activate the row that belongs to the data, which means that you need to apply high voltage to it. And if you want to do something else, you need to apply low voltage to it. Now, if you do it repeatedly, activate pre-charge, activate high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage, high voltage, low voltage. And you can do this programmatically using your software today. It turns out in adjacent, physically adjacent DRAM cells, memory cells, you get bit errors. Now, this should not happen because you're not touching those cells, first of all. This is happening because of electromagnetic coupling between adjacent cells because cells are too close to each other. And also, you're not even modifying the memory. Nothing should change in memory because you're just activating some rows so that you can read from them. So this is certainly something that should not happen. That's why we call this the hammer drawing. We call these the victim rows. And we show that more than 80% of the DRAM chips that are manufactured by three major manufacturers that have more than 99% of the market share in DRAM are vulnerable to this problem. And this is a scaling problem, technology scaling problem, because in older DRAM chips, this did not happen. You couldn't do enough hammerings so that you induce these hammers. But in, in the chips that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013, the cells became too close to each other and too small. As a result, you could induce these hammers, enough hammers, so that you could actually induce these bit flips that should not happen. Now, these bit flips that you induce can belong to some other program, can belong to the operating system, can belong to something security critical that you do not have access to. As a result, this is really a security problem in addition to being a reliability problem. And it affects energy, as we will see as well. So we said that this should not happen. This is a, fun, a memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system. No one should be able to change your data or anybody's data this way. And as a result, someone can hijack your computer in very bad ways to take advantage of the security problem. And while we were actually showing that, Google, the good folks at Google Project Zero who have uncovered a lot of security vulnerabilities took our paper and they showed that they could actually gain kernel privileges using the phenomenon, fundamental phenomenon we have discovered in, in this work. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this work, but after that, once someone can induce a bit flip predictably in some part of your memory, any, uh, all, all, let's say all hell break, breaks loose. Anybody can do anything to your system. These folks from TU Graz showed that they can gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors by taking advantage of these bit flips uh, using their remote JavaScript machine. These folks show that you can take some, your cell phone is completely vulnerable because they can take advantage of these bit flips in your Android phone. And there are a lot of other examples that I'm not gonna talk about, but more recently, neural networks are extremely popular clearly. And neural networks make all kinds of decisions, for example, for self-driving or drones or self-flying, let's say, going into the future. But these folks show that, and these folks and these two folks show that, even though a neural network may be extremely good, more than 90% or more than 99% accurate in its decisions, let's say, in terms of detecting a pedestrian, uh, which is critical, of course, safety critical, they become completely useless, meaning completely uh, inaccurate, if someone takes this Rohammer problem and launches an attack to this neural network, and the neural network becomes uh, get to, gets to an accuracy level that's only 10%, which is really bad, as you can see. Right? So we have a serious problem with this security issues, as you can see. Something that we rely that we're going to rely on lives on the computing infrastructure that we are going to rely our lives on that we think is completely intelligent is actually not so intelligent if you have the security vulnerability. And this is true for other security vulnerabilities as well, in my opinion. But I'm talking about the work that we have done which is very fundamental, which is very difficult to prevent. So if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, the Rohammer papers. But how do you solve the problem? Solving the problem requires intelligence inside the memory. 
intelligent controllers can identify these access patterns and prevent these problems. I'm not going to talk into about the details, but before I, uh, before I wrap up this part, I'm going to say that the problem is getting worse. Why? Because cells are becoming too close in recent DRAM chips, and we want to store more data, and recent DRAM chips are more vulnerable, and existing mitigation mechanisms that the industry is employing are not effective. So we need new mitigation mechanisms that we are developing and others are developing. And unfortunately, industry is not very good at solving this problem because they claim that some of the raw hammer, uh, uh, some of the chips that they have manufactured recently are raw hammer free, but we prove that that's not true. That's not correct, basically. We show that you can just enough reverse engineer DRAM chips and the solutions that they put into the DRAM chips today, and you can circumvent these protection mechanisms easily. So we need mechanisms that are much more secure, and we do a lot of work with industry, as you can see, to see if they're vulnerable to these security problems. And we also provide solutions, but I'm not going to go into the details of the solutions, but take my word for it that it's, you need intelligent controllers to actually solve the problem, and you can read the papers for more detail. If you're interested in this topic, we have a lot more detailed lectures on Rohammer, and this is going to be more, more, more and more important going into the future, in my opinion. Okay, let me tie this to general computing infrastructure. Basically, we're talking about infrastructure, and computing is one of the most important infrastructures going into the future. Bridges are one example. This is a Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This is in 1940. Six months later, it collapsed. This is a reliability problem, as you can see, but it's also a safety and security problem. Bridges are clearly extremely important infrastructures. That humanity has been building bridges for thousands of years. And I will say that they're not that important. Computing is a lot more important today than bridges. So we need to take a lot more care in terms of how we design our computing systems in terms of vulnerabilities, reliability, security, and safety. Bridges, unfortunately, are important and there are fatalities, as you can see. This is Minneapolis in 2007, this is Genoa in 2018. So we have bridge disasters, clearly, and it's hard to prevent them. But in computing, maybe we should be able to prevent things better. So I think we need to talk about security and security is very much related to energy also. Safety is also very much related to energy because you can expend a lot of energy to make yourself secure, but that may not be a great trade-off. We need to prevent unforeseen consequences that we have in our intelligent platforms so we can enable platforms like this, where we can trust uh, and the platform can drive for us, can fly for us, can make decisions for us, et cetera, but we're not there yet. So how do we get there? To get there, I think we need to fund design fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe computing architectures. I'm not claiming that I have all the answers for this, but to be able to do that, we need to prevent, predict and prevent such safety, security, reliability issues like Roadhammer and other issues. So to, this is a technology scaling perspective. So to be able to solve rohammer like problems, we need intelligent memories, intelligent infrastructures so that they can patch themselves. They can identify these attacks. They can identify these suspicious access patterns, for example, so that we can avoid failures. And for that, we need processing uh, near memory structures. Okay, that was the push from memory technology, push from technology. Let's talk about pull from systems and applications, which is going to be the top-down approach. And this is important and maybe even more important. Why? Because today data access is a major bottleneck. I've shown you some examples of this. Energy consumption is a key limiter of applications today. And data movement energy dominates computation energy, especially true for off-chip to on-chip movement. I'm going to give you data related to all of this. In my opinion, uh, the question is this. Do we want a future that looks like this, that we are comfortable leaving to our sons and daughters and everyone? Or do we want a future that looks terrible like this, that's burning? I would argue that we want the best of both worlds. We want the energy efficiency and sustainability, but we also want high performance to solve all the serious and much more difficult problems that we're going to face into the future. So how do we get the best of both worlds? So the, the, we need to identify the problem. Basically, the way we design the computing infrastructure today, we cause great energy waste. We also cause great performance loss, but we try to avoid that performance loss. Alone. Why? We're moving data all around. The data and proce processing of the data and the storage of data is far away from each other. So we have very hungry energy, uh, energy hungry interconnects, et cetera, between them. So to overcome the data access latency, we put a lot of overheads in our software and hardware. We put a lot of new mechanisms, multi-threading, for example, out of order execution, prefetching, uh, heavy levels of uh, caching and memory hierarchies, and they cause even more energy waste. So we are in a vicious cycle today to avoid the performance. We, we already have energy waste because we move data. We pose even more energy waste to avoid the movement of data because these mechanisms add more complexity into the system. And when they, when they do not work, they add a lot of latency and even more complexity into the system. So we need to break this vicious cycle. And the vicious cycle, any vicious cycle can be broken by identifying what's the core cause of the problem. And the core cause of the problem is this. 
processing of data is performed far away from the data. And we should not do that basically going into the future. We should realize that a computing system consists of many components, computing, communication, and storage. And we should ensure that all data does not get processed in the processor. We should avoid the processor-centric mindset going into the future. And we know that this is going to be better going into the future because we have a lot of evidence. So this is data from 1990s, as you can see. Dick Sykes was a chief architect of the alpha processors, which were the fastest processors of their time. And after, from Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, when they designed the flagship processors at the time, he basically wrote a one-page article whose title is, It's the Memory Stupid. Basically, he analyzed the performance of a very important data-intensive application at the time, which the processor is designed for. And he said that we designed this processor for this purpose, but the processor is waiting most of the time to get data back from the memory. So it, it's capable. The processor is very capable. It can finish four instructions every cycle, but it's finishing one instruction every five cycles. So it's operating at 5% of its efficiency, which sounds terrible, of course. And he basically said that in the coming decade, memory subsystem design will be the only important design issue for microprocessors. And I agree with this. So fast forward 10 years later, this is data from my own PhD thesis. We worked together with Intel and we showed essentially the same thing. Most of the time, the processor is waiting for data because the data is far away. Okay, you don't believe me, you don't believe Dick Sykes, since everybody believes Google, you can take a look at Google's data from 2015, essentially the same thing. In their workloads, all of their data center workloads, the processor is most of the time waiting for data. It's processing data only 10 to 20% 10 of the time. So this is not good. Basically, this should not happen because these are computing systems, but they're very energy inefficient, low performance and complex because they're grossly imbalanced. And as a result, they become complex and bloated also, their energy efficiency becomes even worse. And as a result, we're back to the picture that I showed you earlier. Even though these are computing systems, most of the resources are dedicated to data storage and movement. Okay, let's take a look at the energy perspective in a different way. This is data from Bill Daly's keynote at High Peak in 2015. The data is old, but the numbers, the relative numbers remain the same. And so if you look at a complicated arithmetic operation, 64-bit double precision floating point operation, it, co it costs 20 picojoules. But a memory access costs 16 nanojoules. That's 800x difference. So data access is 800x or two to three orders of magnitude, the energy of a complex addition. So now this begs the question, if you want to do a simple or complex arithmetic operation, does it really make sense to bring the data from all the way from memory into the processor chip, do the operation and write back the data? And the answer is usually no, because the processor chip doesn't have enough locality in its cache structures to amortize the cost of that data moment energy. And this is becoming worse. You can read more papers about it. And we have written papers about it also, as I mentioned, together with Google, we looked at the application level impact of this energy disparity between storage, data storage and data movement versus data uh, computation. And we showed that more than 60% of the entire system energy spent on data movement. And this is just general application. On some applications, more than 99% of the total system energy becomes spent on data movement because they're very, very data movement intensive in the system. Okay, so I will argue that we do not want to move data for performance, energy, reliability, security. We do not want to move data. What do we want to do? We want to enable a paradigm shift to enable computation with as little data movement as possible when it makes sense. We want to compute data where it makes sense, where data resides. And we want to shift the paradigm of computing such that it's more data centric as opposed to processor centric. So, which means that we need to do processing wherever data is, wherever data is produced, wherever data resides. And memory is a very special place. We place a lot of data inside memory today in many applications. And what we would like to enable is the processor to query the data. The processor asks the memory or the sensor or the camera, please do this processing for me. And the memory itself does the processing, sensor itself does the processing and returns the results so that the results can be communicated to the user, for example. And there are many, many questions here. How do we design the system? How do we design the processor to any memory unit? How do we design the software and hardware interfaces? How do you design the system software compilers and languages? How do you design the uh, algorithms and theoretical foundations of computing? So essentially, uh, this really goes to the heart of the computing stack. We really need to revisit the entire computing stack. But as I said, we can get there step by step. But we also need to revisit the theoretical foundations of computing because if, if people have taken any theory of computing course, theoretical foundations of computing are based on counting operations to understand the complexity of algorithms, for example. I would argue that that's not good enough today. Today, operations are cheap, memory access is costly. So if you really want to evaluate the importance of algorithms, we really want to need to take into account uh, the data movements and data storage properties of the algorithms as well, not just the operations.
So this really needs to change the way we look at computing. Even the theory of computing needs to be data centric going into the future. Okay, now I'm going to talk about two ways of achieving this in the remaining part of the talk. I'm going to do this briefly because it becomes technical quickly, but there are two fundamentally different ways of doing processing in memory. And one way is called processing using memory, and the other way is called processing near memory. Processing using memory is fundamentally different paradigm than what we are used to today. Meaning you have these memory structures, they can store data, but they can also process data using their operational principles. And we're gonna take advantage of those operational analog circuit level, device level principles to actually do the operation computation like AND, OR, XOR, addition, multiplication, in addition to storage properties. Processing near memory adds a processor very close to memory. So it's similar to today's approach, but it moves the processor very, very close to memory. But it doesn't use the operational principles of memory. It uses the operational principles of the processor next to the memory. So that's why these two things are extremely important to do together, but they're different fundamentally. So let me give you a couple of examples. I'm going to give, go through this relatively quickly because of time limitations, but I'm going to give you a couple of examples to show you that the impact can be very large. I'm going to give you an example of data copy initialization. And data copy initialization it happens in all systems. Uh, for example, if you have a database that's one terabyte, to initialize that database, you basically need to wait for minutes and minutes, and it consumes a lot of energy. I'm going to say that it's, it can be much, much faster and much uh, more energy efficient. And you can see that data copy initialization actually consumes a lot of cycles in data centers. And these, this is just a fraction of the data copy initialization in Google. So how do we do data copy today? If you want to copy this, white page to this gray page, you need to go through the processor. There's no reason. But today, systems are processor-centric. So you need to, for example, if you want to do a four kilobyte copy, if it's a small copy, you need to bring the source page all the way into the processor. You need to bring the destination page all the way into the processor. So you consume a lot of energy. And then you actually write back the data. So high latency, high bandwidth utilization, cache pollution, unwanted data mounts, so a lot of problems, basically. And as a result, a simple, very simple data copy actually consumes a lot of nanoseconds and a lot of microjoules. But how do we do it in the future? It's a good idea to use the operational principles of memory to do it inside the memory and not disturb anything else in the system. You could do, also, do it also inside the sensor, for example. This low latency, low bandwidth utilization, no cache pollution, no unwanted data moment. As a result, you can save an order of magnitude performance and almost two orders of magnitude energy. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but in DRAM, and in many memory technology, you can implement this very simply by activating a source row, which brings the data into the sense amplifiers, and then you activate the destination row, which brings the data from the sense amplifiers to the destination row. So by doing two consecutive activates with negligible hardware cost, by just changing your mindset, the paradigm, you can do this with or an order of magnitude latency improvement and almost two orders of magnitude, let's say, energy improvement, if you optimize this, of course. And ignore the other bar bars over here, we generalize this. I'm not going to go into the details, but you can read the papers for more details where we introduce the topic. And later work showed that you can actually do this in real DRAM chips by violating the timing parameters, for example. And there are many questions related to this. I'm not going to answer them in this particular talk, but you can find answer to these in uh, our papers as well as our uh, lectures if you're interested in the details of the mechanisms. And these are the papers you can see. Okay, so let me talk about the mindset and uh, how we change the mindset. Basically, we have a lot of accelerator mechanisms today, machine learning accelerators, video accelerators, audio accelerators, GPUs, CPUs, et cetera. They're all sitting on the left side of the memory bus. So why don't we have an accelerators on the right side, let's say correct side of the memory bus over here so that we can minimize the data moment. So we're treating memory as a conventional accelerator and we have an accelerator on the memory side so that the memory data moment becomes minimal. Okay, similarly, we can do truly in memory computation. You can do AND, OR, NOT, and majority circuits in DRAM at low cost by using the analog computation capability of the memory chips. And the key idea is activating multiple rows concurrently performs computation. So you can do 8 million bits of data uh, AND and OR, for example, inside a DRAM chip. And this leads to 30 to 60x performance energy improvements. And you can read the paper for more detail. And emerging memory technologies, new memory technologies, enable even more opportunities, memory stores, resistor RAM, phase change memory, STTM RAM, because you can operate on data with minimal movement in those cases, because these are fundamentally non-volatile technologies. DRAM, dynamic random access memory, is fundamentally volatile. So you need to move the data just, just a little bit at least, but you can minimize that data moment. So I'm not going to go into the details, but this shows that you can do triple row activation in DRAM. If you do a triple row activation in a circuit like DRAM, based on the chart sharing of analog operational principles, you get a majority function. This is a bitwise majority function. If two cells are charged, you get the charge state at the end. If two cells are discharged, you get the discharge state at the end. 
And bitwise majority is a great function because you can derive and and or functions out of it. And if you actually add a not function, a, a, a complement or inverse function, which we do in our work, now you can have a functionally complete Boolean complete circuit. You can translate any algorithm to this Boolean complete substrate, analog operational substrate, where you can actually do operations. And we did that exactly. Uh, and you can see the results in this particular case, we accelerated database queries. And you can see that you can get more than order of magnitude performance improvement in database latencies, which is actually quite hard to improve uh, in today's systems because they're heavily optimized. So an order of magnitude improvement translates to around an order of magnitude energy improvement as well. So if you're interested, you can read more in these papers. And we have recently written book chapters that are in my debt related to this. And we have recently made this more programmable. And this framework actually shows that you can program it more easily going into the future. And similarly, we can also do security functions in DRAM using analog operational principles. I'm not going to talk about these detail in detail, but you can do physical unclonable functions in DRAM memories. You can also do true random number generation in memories. This is really important for processing inside the memory security critical functions, but I don't have time for detail. So I will uh, let you uh, read the papers and watch the lectures. Let me quickly talk about the processing near memory approach, which is basically pushing memory, uh, pushing processing structures near the memory so that you can have a processor near memory. And this is motivated by accelerating applications, making them much more efficient. And when we first started the topic, we actually looked at graph processing, which is at the core of many, many workloads, including bioinformatics, including machine learning. And large-scale graph processing is challenging because it has a lot of random accesses, basically, and little amount of computation. So how do we deal with this? Basically, we have this 3D stacking memory technologies. You have memory layers and logic layer. And we put processing mechanisms inside the logic layer. And the logic layer can have high bandwidth, low latency access to memory so that you don't go off the chip to another processor, let alone the data center. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but in the logic layer, we have many, many processors, computing units. So you can see that in order course, these can communicate with each other. And as a result, we don't move the data around, but we move the functions to the data. So the data stays. And if you want to update a graph, graph node, for example, the update functions get shipped to the processor that hosts the data in the memory layers. And we keep basically programming this in a data centric manner. And if you want to scale this up, you, you have many, many of these 3D stack cubes connected to each other in an interconnected manner. And you have graph, your graph processing, uh, graph, uh, graph, uh, graph structure partitioned on these chips so that you can exploit locality. This looks like a primitive GPU. GPUs used to be like this in 1990s. And in my opinion, uh, processing systems are going to be like this in 2020, for example, or no, 2030s, for example, uh, or maybe even earlier, who knows. Uh, and we're going to offload computation and program it with remote function calls so that we minimize data movements and we'll have prefetching mechanisms. But let me give you some idea in terms of what this looks like. So these are traditional systems. Tesseract system doesn't look like any traditional system. Traditional systems have processing and memory separate. As a result, they're bottlenecked by the bandwidth of the memory. Tesseract system, you cannot decouple the processing and memory. Processing and memory are together in these things. And you can have eight terabytes per second access to DRAM, as you can see, which is more than an order of magnitude higher than the best system at the time. As a result, we can accelerate graph processing significantly, we can get more than, uh, more than 13x performance improvement, and we didn't optimize this. Over the course of the late, last six years, other people have developed algorithms and infrastructures that made this 13x, 100x. So we can have today two orders of magnitude improvement in terms of performance of graph processing. And uh, in our results, we had more than 8x energy reduction, but later work that built on our work showed that you can get almost two orders of magnitude improvement. So this is very significant, as you can see. And this is just graph processing. Machine learning has similar. I don't have time to uh, talk about this, but machine learning is very similar uh, in, in, in this respect. I'm going to give you an example that's closer to reality in the near future, the work with, that we did with Google. Uh, with Google, we looked at consumer devices, and we looked at popular workloads that many people use, Google or not Google, it doesn't matter. Many people use these kind of workloads. And we wanted to understand the energy cost of data movement. And as I mentioned earlier, we found out that data movement costs more than 60% of their energy, energy in our systems. And we wanted to understand how to get rid of it as much as possible. And we found out that a significant fraction of the data moment comes from simple functions and applications. And once you identify those simple functions, you can implement them in memory, uh, in 3D stack memory, like we discussed. You can have small embedded low power cores, or you can have small fixed function accelerators, or you can have reconfigurable logic as we discussed in some of our works. And by doing this in a targeted manner, you can actually reduce energy and improve performance by more than 2x. So this is not 13x. It's not two orders of magnitude. In an unoptimized way, it's 2x, 
but it's very e relatively much more easier to do in the short term. So short term is also important. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but we analyze all these functions. I'm going to talk about the machine learning framework since machine learning is extremely important, but machine learning, more than 50% of the inference energy is spent on data moment, and more than 50% of that energy comes from two functions only, packing and unpacking and quantization. And if you're interested, you can see our works for more detail, but we actually offload these functions to get more than 2x performance improvement and energy improvement. And you can read the paper for more detail if you're interested. Similarly, there are a lot of works where we can distribute the processing in GPUs so that you can actually reduce the data moment. Uh, you can do it in pointer chasing, which is very latency sensitive. You can do it for uh, more automatically in system. You can do it for prefetching. We do works for climate modeling and we can accelerate them using FPGAs and 3D stack memory. Uh, you can do it for genome analysis, approximate trick matching, as we discussed earlier. You can do it for time series analysis, which is used for used in many scientific domains like astronomy, for example. Uh, but to be able to do this, you need to revisit the entire stack and co-design the algorithm and the architectures together. But I believe we can get there step by step going into the future. And if you're interested in this, we have a primer on processing in memory that we have written recently in December. It covers a lot of issues and importance of processing in memory and why we need to go through it. And we have other papers also related to it. Now, before I conclude, let me say that this is actually real, meaning People are designing processing in DM engines, and we're working with this Upmem folks, who are, who are a startup company in France. They have actually put DRAM chips, uh, put processing units inside DRAM chips inside the bank. And we actually do have done studies. Uh, we have ported applications, and these are real systems. This is a real system that we used, for example, 2,560 2, processing elements inside a rank. And we have actually works that describe how this operates. You can see that. Right next to the DRAM bank, you have a processor and you can offload applications to it. And we have written papers. If you're interested, you can see the papers. You can see our seminars related to this. I'm not going to talk about this, but we have basically shown that you can actually see, do much higher performance and much lower energy processing in real applications today in these systems. And we have recently written an overview paper on FPGA-based, uh, reconfigurable architecture-based near memory acceleration of data intensive applications, including climate modeling and bioinformatics, and I would actually uh, suggest that you take a look at it if you're interested. Now, even more interestingly, the Samsung uh, folks have recently put processing inside the memory after let's say 10 years, we started working on this. The Samsung folks finally have put some limited processing inside the memory, as you can see, so that they can accelerate machine learning applications. This is very limited compared to what we are envisioning, but it's a good step. Uh, it's a, right spe a correct step in the good direction, in my opinion. And they have recently introduced this in the ISSCC conference. If you're interested, you can take a look at their paper as well. But we have a lot of lectures on this, and I'm going to leave these uh, links with you if you're interested. And I've recently given an IEDM tutorial on memory-centric computing systems, which cover a lot of different aspects of memory-centric computing systems. OK, so that brings me almost to the end of the talk. Basically, we want fundamentally energy-efficient data uh, arch computing architectures, which means that architectures need to be data-centric. We also want fundamentally high performance computing architectures, which also means that architectures need to be data centric. So data centric architectural paradigm brings us high performance, energy efficiency, high reliability, high security, low vulnerabilities, and many, many other things as well. So to be able to do this, I think we need to minimize the data moment as much as possible. Of course, adoption is a big issue in a new paradigm and we need to consider adoption. And there are many adoption issues. I'm not gonna talk about these in detail. Software is important, programming is important, system support is important. Runtime and compilation systems is important. Infrastructure services, benefits, and feasibility are important, but all can be solved with a change of mindset. Today, we have a processor-centric mindset in the way we treat data. That mindset needs to be destroyed and we need to move to a data-centric mindset. And by doing that, we can change the, fundamentally, we can improve the energy consumption and performance of our systems. Okay, if you're interested, we're also doing a lot of issues in the adoption and we have this methodology and workloads that we have open source. A lot of the work we have are open source as you can see in the archive papers also. And if you're interested, you can watch the lectures as well. So PIM processing in memory, data-centric architectures can enable new medical platforms in my opinion, as I discussed, these medical platforms can benefit greatly from data-centric architectures. And that's something we're working on. And again, I'll point you to papers because we do not have time. So what we do not have time for is two other directions in system design, data-driven or self-optimizing, self-learning computing architectures. That's the second one. And the third one is data aware, expressive computing architects that understand extremely well different types of data and adapt to the different types of data. And again, I will re refer you to this tutorial and our lectures. So let me conclude, since we don't have much time at this point. So today's architectures are processor-centric, human-driven, and component-aware. 
we're trying to make them data centric, data driven, and data aware. And to be able, uh, to, why do we want to do that? Because we have a huge data handling problem. We have a huge data problem, memory and storage problem. And to be able to overcome this problem, we need to have principled system architectures. We want to design complete systems to be truly balanced, high performance and energy efficient. And that leads us to intelligent systems. And that requires, in my opinion, us to be data centric, data driven, and data aware. We want to enable computation capability inside and close to memory and sensors. This can lead to orders of magnitude improvements in performance and energy. This can enable new applications and computing platforms. It can enable a better understanding of nature as well, which we do not have time for, but that's true in my opinion, and who knows what else. And I believe for this, we need to design architectures to be fundamentally better. And who knows, in my opinion, we have tried to imitate, uh, let's say natural designs, but we didn't do a good job of it. If you look at nature, it's fundamentally more data-centric and data-driven and data-aware. There's a lot of specialization. There's a lot of... Uh, data, uh, data centric processing. There's no dichotomy between process and memory, for example, it's very distributed. So to be able to, we really need to imitate some of the fundamentals of the nature as opposed to higher level uh, things that we just see maybe on the surface. But of course, to be able to do that, it's not easy. We need to revisit the entire stack, but with a change of mindset, we can get there step by step. And to be able to do that, we need to exploit good principles. And more than anything else, we need open minds and we need a lot of investment into science and technology, fundamental science and technology. And again, I'm going to leave you with uh, uh, this uh, paper that we have written that talks about all of these issues and more, and the tutorial. And I will thank the people who have funded our research over the years. Please keep funding us. Uh, without this funding, this research couldn't have happened. And certainly, more importantly, uh, without the contributions of my students and, and researchers, the Safari Research Group, none of this would have happened. And I will uh, let you explore uh, our newsletters if you're interested uh, in this. Everything that I've discussed is open source and online. You can find it uh, in videos, lectures, slides, and open source software. And I'm happy to take questions at this point. Thank you very much. Hello? Uh, I, I, I cannot hear you. Uh-oh. Let me see. I'm speechless about your presentation, so it's excellent. Okay. I, I, I find it so, I'm in shock, quite honestly, and uh, your work is excellent. Without you, this team couldn't be there, quite honestly, uh, making your profile low, because I feel you are modest. And uh, we have a few questions. Thank Let you. Direct you, one from, Professor Ibrahim Dincher, building energy consumption. Sorry, sorry. Um, yes, Annette Pratt Cowell. As most of the work done is on Intel system, is R R A R M not vulnerable to raw hammer? So that's a good question. It is vulnerable. So any any type of computing system today is vulnerable. So ARM systems are vulnerable. AMD systems, Intel systems, IBM systems, Qualcomm systems. As long as you can design a memory controller that can activate rows fast enough, which all companies can do today easily, it is vulnerable. So uh, it's, a vul it's a vulnerability that's across the entire computing uh, system world, let's say. So probably the security issues is going to be a huge problem in the coming future, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. In my opinion, yeah. In my opinion, energy, uh, energy and security are very related, as I mentioned. But security issues are going to be extremely important in terms of how much energy they consume to, uh, so that we can overcome these problems. And they consume performance also at the same time. If you do not design fundamentally secure systems, we may actually find ourselves in a position to be able to secure these systems. We're spending too much energy and too much performance. Essentially, we're wasting a lot of the infrastructure that we have built. So we need to change our mindset, in my opinion, so that we can design much more secure and uh, private systems, let's say. There's another question from Ibrahim Dincher. What is your view on the huge amount of energy consumption on, of Bitcoin operations? So thank you. That's, that's also an excellent question. I mean, I, we, do not, we did not study Bitcoin, but I have some uh, familiarity with the operations. And in my view, there's a huge energy waste over there as well. And uh, some of the energy waste is coming from computation. 
And some of the energy waste is also coming from data movement. Uh, again, in my, uh, again, we do not have hard data, but according to anecdotal uh, evidence uh, from the field based on what we uh, do with other people, we see that data movement, again, data centric crossing can help over there. But in my opinion, uh, in that area, we also need to revisit some of the algorithms, uh, uh, Bitcoin and uh, yeah, some of the algorithms uh, tend to be fundamentally energy inefficient. And I think we need to solve that issue as well. Thank you, sir. That's another question from Ibrahim Dinter. Uh, do you think that we will have a more secure internet in the future? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a. Uh, can you hear me still? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is much better for me. That's why. Um, yes. So I think uh, that's a great question that people have tried to uh, secure the internet for decades and decades. Uh, one of the issues with uh, internet is really uh, the standards and also how people are used to uh, the status quo, right? It's very hard to change all of the routers in the internet at the same time so that you can secure everything. But the good news is uh, people are working on it. And uh, I will actually, if you're interested, I will point you to some work uh, that is done uh, at ETH Zurich by Adrian Tarek from the Network Security Group. They have a fundamentally secure internet structure called Scion. And uh, they're, uh, they're starting to uh, make the internet, let's say, more secure step by step by first tackling the internet security problem in the uh, Swiss banking system, let's say. So I think if you if you start uh, by the right, uh, with the right places and with the with the fundamentally secure internet design, over time you can you can grow. But of course, changing it, changing the entire internet uh, overnight or even over years is going to be very difficult. But I think people are working on it. That's the good that's the good part. Okay, thank you, sir. There's another uh, question from Nader Jawani. He's thanking you for. This is delivering such a futuristic talk is asking, can we say that there is a switch from reductionism to holism in the world of data? My oh. pronunciation was awful, sir. No, no, that's okay. Redu <laughs> reductionism to holism. Okay, I see. So I think uh, I think what uh, what the questioner is trying to say is. In the past, we tried to re reduce the data and uh, not to operate on as much as uh, perhaps. And today we're operating on everything, let's say. We're producing a lot of data and we're not really trying to reduce it as much as possible. And maybe that's correct. I think, especially with the neural networks, uh, machine learning, people, try, uh, people left it to machines to figure out what's going on by dumping data on them, right? And uh, I, would, I, would, I would agree with this overall statement with the rise of machine learning. And maybe it's, it's happened because the hardware architectures have been extremely successful because GPUs have enabled the machine learning revolution because GPUs were very good at number crunching. But again, maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe, maybe the pendulum has swung too far into the holism. Maybe we really need to rethink our algorithms so that uh, we don't try to, uh, we don't leave, uh, we don't try to sift through all of the data that's produced, but we try to be more select, more and more selective. But that right. said, uh, that said, I think it's also difficult because in some domains you can do it. In some domains, it's harder to do it. Uh, you need to develop very good domain-specific knowledge to be able to reduce the data. And I think the reason machine learning has been very successful is uh, it doesn't require domain-specific knowledge in some areas. So in my opinion, uh, we need to be able to uh, do both holistic data processing, uh, such that throwing the data into the machine and sifting through it. But over time, the machine should learn how to reduce the data. And what's not happening is that, I think, over time, the machine is not learning how to reduce the data today. I think self-optimizing algorithms, uh, self-optimizing uh, machines themselves, as I mentioned, which, didn't, which we didn't talk about, is going toward that direction, basically. Over, over time, you can reduce the data that you're dealing with. Also, is Dr. Jawan is continuing asking this question, if this is the case, how we can differentiate, differentiate data aware information, knowledge, and intelligence from each other, and which one would accelerate the intelligent machines, privileges, and the new generation dominance. Probably oh. Dr. Javan is trying to get your job, sir. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very broad question. And if I knew the answer, yeah, maybe maybe I would be <laughs> a billionaire right now. But <laughs> so, <laughs> question <laughs> exactly yeah so i yeah i think this is important but it's very it's perhaps uh, a bit too broad to actually 
have a, a scientifically correct answer to at this point. I think we need to explore many directions basically to understand where we can reduce, where we can be data aware, where we can throw data uh, heavily. And over time, I think paradigms will emerge. But I can say, uh, I can say with confidence that if we uh, take the principles that I mentioned in my talk, we can do it much better without wasting energy. Probably, sir, when we look, you mentioned the nature, nature is, is going to give us a lot of information, quite often. you know, that how we are going to, going to handle the problem. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, if you understand nature, we can do better also. You're, you're absolutely right, yes. <laughs> so there's another question, or there's comments, sorry. For raw hammer, please throw some light for mapping virtual address to physical address for find and row, column and blank bank bits. Mm -hmm. It is related to finding geometry of DR drum tips for R ARM. Mm -hmm. Okay. And continue the comments. For Rohammer, please throw some. Yeah. Okay, I think it's the same question. Let's <laughs> again. Let's again. Sorry. Okay. Uh, for Rohammer, please throw some lights for mapping virtual address. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, this is a very technical question, also, and uh, and uh, so basically, in order to be able to, to uh, do the attack, Rohammer attack, uh, you need to understand where data is mapped, and that is not an easy problem. But uh, a lot of people know how to do this. So it's reverse engineering, basically. Even though this mapping is not exposed to the software designers and engineers, people are smart. They can reverse engineer. So here, I cannot give you an exact result because it's really very much dependent on the system. ARM system, Intel system, AMD system, IBM system, Qualcomm system, all have different data mappings. Different chips have different data mappings. But people have developed uh, tools to reverse engineer those mappings. I, will, uh, I can point you to our... Rohammer retrospective paper in Transactions on Computer Aided Design that uh, has pointers to some papers that have done reverse engineering of memory chips as well as systems. You can take a look at that. Or there's this drama, uh, DRAM A drama work from uh, Fry University in Amsterdam, where they have also built a tool to be able to do this. We have our trespass work recently, where we have actually used some of the tools to do this. So this is a known problem, basically. If you want to do a row hammer attack, you can use one of these tools, develop your own tool so that you can reverse engineer. And it's relatively easy uh, right now. So thank you very much for your kind presentation and answering the questions. I'm very proud to listen to you. Thank you again for your uh, nice presentation. Sir. Okay, thank, okay. thank you very much, Professor Chakran. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me.